So let's jump into the question 2.3. We're going to spend about five to 10 minutes here. This question has to do with uh, the topic relating to genetics. So we're going to look at how we answer this question. OK, so the question reads as follows. Um, Mr. Muslopi crossbreed a white cow and they give you the capital letter W, which is white, uh, with a black bull and you have the capital letter B there. And it says the offspring in the F1 um, um, generation will be looked uh, as indicated in the diagram below. And you guys can clearly see the diagram here in front of you. I'm just going to get my laser pointer up so I can highlight a few things uh, so you guys can see it. So you are crossing a black bull with capital letter B with a white cow with capital letter W. OK, now when the letters are in capital, OK, the first thing you need to understand as a grade 12 learner is that capital means it's dominant. OK, if it is non-dominant, then we're going to use a small letter W or a small letter B and we call that um, recessive. So because you are looking at a capital W, which is over here, and a capital B, which is over here, you must write down for yourself, this is a dominant trait. OK, so just try and remember that, first of all, that you're looking at two dominant traits. Second of all, um, when you look at two dominant traits and they, are, they only give you one letter, you can kind of assume that both um, letters must be capital letter, meaning that because it's dominant, it's capital W, capital W, and it's capital B, capital B. OK, so they will tell you in the question that the anim animal or the individual is heterozygous. Then you will have one capital and one small letter. But if they don't state heterozygous, you can assume it is homozygous and homozygous means both capital letters. OK, so that's the first thing you need to understand when it comes to these crosses is that you need to identify number one. Is it um, dominant and you how do you identify if it's dominant? The capital letter or the small letter will tell you. OK, so we know you're crossing two dominant traits and then you get an F1 offspring and here's the F1 offspring. And now you need to look at this offspring and see what characteristics the offspring has. And from what I can see, it has characteristics of both the black bull, meaning it's it's black, and it has white spots, meaning it has both the characteristics of both parents, if that makes sense to you guys. OK, now I did ask you to work through this yesterday, not yesterday, the day before yesterday. I gave it to you as homework, so I'm going to assume that you guys have worked through this already and therefore I am going to the on I'm going to go through the answers, but you can stop me um, and just pop a question in the, in the chat if you want me to explain the answer, but I'm going to assume you guys have gone through the answers already. So question 2.3.1 says which type of dominance is illustrated in the example above? Now you have you've learned three types of dominance, isn't it? You've learned complete dominance. That is when the trait completely masks or um, completely dominates the other trait. For example, brown eyes is dominant over blue eyes. So if you cross a brown eye and a blue eye person, the, the offspring will probably have brown eyes. So that is complete dominance where the one trait is not expressed. Then you learn something called incomplete um, dominance, excuse me. <clears throat> and incomplete dominance is when you have a mix of the two traits. OK, so what do I mean by a mix? Um, if we cross, for example, a white flower with a red flower, then you would get a pink flower. And that is incomplete dominance. So I want you guys to try and put a picture or put a mental image to each type of dominance. Complete blue eyes, brown eyes. You always have brown eyes if um, brown eyes is dominant. Uh, incomplete, where you have a, a red and pink, uh, sorry, red and white flower gives you a pink flower. And finally, you have um, co-dominance. And co-dominance is when both of the um, phenotypes are expressed. As in the example that you see here, black and white are expressed. Now, where do you look? How do I know which type of dominance it is? you look at the offspring, the F1, OK? If the F1 was uh, only black, that would have been complete dominance or only white. If it was, uh, if you cross black and white, you would get, I don't know, silver. So if, it was, if the offspring was silver, you would say it was incomplete dominance. But because the offspring has characteristics of both, the answer there is co-dominance, OK? And there is um, 2.3.1, A is co-dominance over there. Yes, oh, sir. Um, we have Rosendahl. Hi. They also said the three 
2.3.1 is co-dominance. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, and well done to you guys there. OK, so as I said, guys, the, the idea is just to help you to understand how to approach the question. Number B says explain the answer. Now you have to say why. And if you listen carefully, when I was explaining, I said it. It is when in the if one, both, and I want to highlight this word both here. It is when both of the characteristics of the parents are expressed, meaning you are seeing both black and white. So both appear, that's what you could say, or you could say, um, yeah, both is actually the only thing you can say. Uh, both parents uh, appear, okay, or black and white appear in the offspring, meaning it is there is no intermediate. Remember what I said, where do you get an intermediate? Which type of dominance? I'm going to see who's quickest on the chat. Um, which type of dominance would you see the intermediate? In this example, there is no intermediate. Then looking at 2.3.2, <clears throat> where you have to write down the genotypes with regards to fur color. Now, here's what I want you guys to remember when you see the word genotypes. We're going to get to phenotypes um, in the next question. The, the word genotypes, whenever you see this word, you must think gene. So I'm thinking genotype, genes. You don't think black, white, pink, red. They don't want the color. They don't want to know what it looks like. That's the phenotype, okay? So when you see the word genotype, the thing that pops into your head is genes. That's the number one thing. The second thing that pops into your head is the letters, the letters, okay? Because the genotype is indicated by the letters. So you don't think color. Put that thought to bed. If, if, your, if your head says it's black and it's white, when it says genotype, that's incorrect. Don't think what it looks like for genotype. Think the, the, the genes, which is the letters. And finally, you always give two letters. So three things there. One, you think about the, um, you don't think about the, the color or what it looks like. Two, you think about the genes. And number three, you give the letters and it's always three letters. So if you look at the P1 cow, okay? The P1 cow would be this one over here. And in my P1 cow, am I looking at the, the black or the white cow? It's obviously the white cow. Then I go back to my question and I see a oh, white cow. It says the code, the genotype is W. So I know for A, I'm going to have a W there, not a B, because the B was for black. Okay. And remember, I said it's always two letters. So for A, it's going to be WW. And I hope you guys got that one right. For the P1 bull, now you're looking at the bull and you can see the capital letters B. So that's going to be capital letter B and it's going to be BB. Okay, now it gets interesting when it asks you for C, um, the offspring in the F1 or the F1 offspring. Okay, so here you can see both um, in the bull, sorry, in the offspring over here, there is both um, black and white, meaning there's black spots and there is white spots. So whenever we have co-dominance, you always have both the black, which is the B, as well as the white being expressed. So here in the F1 offspring, you're gonna have B, capital B for black, and you're gonna have capital white or capital W for white. And here is your answers here for 3.2. Okay. And remember, as I said, always two letters. So WW, always capital letter. Please don't write it as a small letter because the markers will read that as a recessive trait. Um, so you always write two capital letters. And for C, it doesn't matter which one came first as long as you have P and W present over there. Doesn't matter which one first. Okay. Now, you might be wondering what would happen if you wrote BB and WW. That is technically not correct, okay? Because now you're looking at something called polyploidy, where you have too many chromosomes. So rather stick with one B and one W for the offspring. Okay, and it's as simple as that. I hope that makes some sense to you guys. I'm gonna move on to question 2.3.3. And um, question 2.3.3 read uh, a bull and a cow from the above if one generation. Let me just go back. Apologies. Here we go. A bull and a cow from the F1 um, is crossed or is allowed to interbreed at least. You must use a genetic cross to show the phenotypic ratio of the F2 generation. Okay. Now I'm going to highlight 
this word phenotypic. Phenotypic. Remember I said when you see the word genotypic, you think genes and you think um, letters and that letters will be given to you in the question. When you see the word phenotypic, phenotypic means physical, what I physically see. And when it comes to phenotypic, you need to say how many um, of the offspring will be white, black, or white and black. That's what phenotypic means. So always write in for yourself, genotypic, it means genes. Phenotypic, it means physical characteristics. Then it's going to be a lot easier for yourself. Okay, so you have to do a cross for this one. I am going to trust that you guys have done this as homework. So I'm going to go straight to the answer. Um, I'm not going to give time to work through this because I trust you guys did. So what do we do when we look at a cross? OK, so I'm going to put up the answer, but I want to do it step by step. So I just want you guys to follow me step by step. First question is what were you crossing? Are you crossing the P1 bull? Are you crossing the P1 cow? Or are you crossing the F1 generation? What you're crossing here in this example is the F1 generation. OK, so because you're crossing the F1, you can completely ignore that. And I would recommend you scratch that out for yourself. Otherwise, you're just going to confuse yourself. So you're not crossing that anymore. You're crossing the um, F1 generation. OK, now you know that the phenotype for the F1 was obviously black and white or black with white spots. Doesn't matter. But you know it was both black and white. It wasn't only black. Also, it wasn't only white, it was both. But do you know what the genes are for the F1 generation? Yes, you do, because you had it here. So there's the genotype, okay, for C. And remember, it was one cap, one letter B, and one letter W. So you're basically gonna be crossing one of these, a B, W, with another one of those, a B, W. So it's gonna be B, W, cross with B, W, for the genotype. What was the phenotype? It was um, the black and white pool. Okay, meaning it is both colors or black with white spots, regardless. So let's look at how you do that. Starting on top, so if you look at this over here, remember we're busy now with the P2 because you are crossing the F1 offspring. So your phenotype in the F2, as I explained, was both black and white pool. So there you see it. And you times that with a black and white cow. OK, you could have just said black and white times black and white. You would get a mark for that one over here. OK, then your genotype. I just explained that. So if you have the phenotype, give yourself a mark. The genotype is at the bottom and I just want to highlight this. It was the BW which you got from your answer in C. Do you guys see how important it is that you get these things right? Because if this was incorrect, you had C then the next question would be incorrect as well. But you guys obviously got it correct, so we can continue. So it's BW, and you're going to cross that with BW. Okay, now there are two ways you can do it from here. Okay, sorry, and that's a mark over there. So you have two marks already, one mark there, one mark there. You already have two out of six if you just wrote down the phenotype, and you got this right here. Two out of six, that's easy, easy marks. Now the next a uh, few things I'm going to mention is that you are going to have um, my hostess occurring and fertilization. So because you get a mark for both of them, one mark only, you have to mention my hostess and fertilization, but obviously in the correct order, meaning my hostess happens first. That's the one after the, the genotype and then the gamut will be B, W, B, W. All you did here was you separated it. OK, there's a bit of space between them. Then that shows you meiosis occurred. Don't write them close together because then we don't see it as meiosis having occurred. Just put the space, even if it's just a little bit of space, put a bit of space there or put a comma or a semicolon, anything just to indicate that meiosis occurred. Then we read it as meiosis occurred. So you separated them now and now you have to cross them. OK. Now, I know some teachers teach, uh, show you to cross it via the one. Let me just use my red pen here. You can say, right, this B, going to go with that B, and then you get B, B, and there's one of them. This B goes with that W, then you get B, W. That's the second one. Then you say the W goes with the B, then you get the third B, W, and the W goes to the W, and then you get to capital to W's and that's okay to do. That's actually very, very easy to do. And then you have your genotype. 
excuse me, your genotypes there in the F1 generation. The other way of doing it is doing a Punnett square, which you guys see here at the bottom. And the Punnett square is where you just make a little block. You put your gametes in over here for your gametes will be B and W. And then you cross these gametes and then you get BB for the first offspring. You get BW for the second one. And then you get a uh, BW here for the third one and you get WW here for the last one. And the Punnett square is what you can also do. That's also going to be one mark. But where are you getting your marks here? You're getting your marks for showing the ratio. So the ratio here, I'm just going to show it in my red pen, was one BB, which was black. Remember, you want the phenotypic ratio. Two black and white, or BW, which was these ones over here in the middle, where I'm writing now. Or you can get it from the Punnett square. And then lastly, one white, which is what you got here, the last genotype, or you get it from the Punnett square. And the ratio there was one, two, one. And you will see here there is a capital, not a capital, a bold and an asterisk here, meaning that mark is compulsory. It means you have to, have to, have to write this ratio down because the question said give the ratio, isn't it? So this ratio here is important. And that's your compulsory mark. If you did everything else and you forgot to write the ratio, you would only get five out of six instead of the six out of six. OK, and I hope as you guys are marking this, you got it right. I'm going to pause here for about six, seven seconds just to take any questions from any teacher, any learner, anything that's unclear. I will happily go over it again. All right, I see no questions here um, in the chat, so I'm assuming everyone is okay. If you guys are still with me, just give me a thumbs up as I go along. Uh, that's going to help me to also see that you guys are still following. Okay, if there's no questions, I'm going to continue and we are going to 2.4. Yes, is there a question? I hear a mic is unmuted. Okay, the question isn't coming through, so I'm going to... I think the sound is coming from your side, so... It oh, it's sounds... echoing. It sounds like there's uh, somebody's breaking down something on your side. Okay, yeah, my learners are present in the class, so that's probably an echo from my side. Um, okay, so we, we, we're going to move on. So 2.4, let me just go on here, has to do with this diagram. Okay, so 2.4 is the diagram below represents the distribution of um, chromosome P21. Now in your head, when you see chromosome P21, we know that we learn this disorder with regards to chromosome 21. Quickest one in the chat, what is the disorder that has to do with chromosome 21? We're gonna get there a bit later. Um, as it appears in the gametes at the end of meiosis two in the human um, male. Okay, so you're looking at A, B, C, and D. As you guys can see in the diagram, and you need to understand two things here. OK, one is that C and D has no chromosomes. So something happened here and there's a disorder for that. And the question, the question will ask what that disorder is. That's the first thing. And the second thing is you would have learned about this uh, during term one or two. And the disorder that you that needs to come to mind when you see chromosome 21 is obviously Down syndrome. Um, that's what needs to jump into your head, and then yes, the rest sir, we have Casey Chris Casey Chris Down syndrome. Fantastic. Well done. Okay, so whenever you see chromosome 21, Down syndrome must jump into your head. Now it is question 2.4.1. Explain why the gametes in diagram C and D do not have any chromosomes. Now, we know it's Down syndrome, and we know something happened here, but we need to now try and figure out, okay, why isn't there any chromosomes? and C in C and D. Now, whenever you ask the question on mahusis, okay, and it doesn't matter which question it is, you need to remember the following. When we speak about mahusis, we have to always mention two things, okay? The first thing you have to mention is the phase. So try and memorize your phases for mahusis. 
And the second thing you have to um, keep in mind for myosis is the disorder. So we know it's Down syndrome, but we also know Down syndrome comes from a disorder or a, a mistake, if you can put it that way, or something goes wrong, and we call that non-disjunction. I hope you guys can remember that, non-disjunction. Okay, so whenever you have a chromosome or a cell being empty, then that means non-disjunction happened. And if I can ask someone in the chat or someone at, um, on the other side, just to let me know in the chat or even just unmute your mic and tell me what exactly happens during non-disjunction. Something happens. What happens during non-disjunction? It has to do with the chromosomes, right? So something happens there. That's my first question. And my second question is, where does non-disjunction -dis, um, occur? Does it occur in interphase? Does it occur in uh, metaphase? Does it occur in telophase? Where does non-disjunction occur? So that's the two things that has to come to your head for 2.4.1. Okay, we must explain why the gametes in C and D do not have any chromosomes. Non-disjunction occurred. We know that. And we know that where it occurred, you need to know that. That would be during which phase? I'm going to come back to that. Then 2.4.2 says if gamut A is involved in fertilization, describe how this may result in Down syndrome. Now you need to understand, okay, Down syndrome is what happened there. And if A and B is involved in fertilization, something's going to go wrong there. I see the chat is going up. Okay. Um, I see it says failure of chromosomes to separate during anaphase. Fantastic. Okay, that is correct. Um, perseverance, but you have to say which anaphase? Anaphase 1, anaphase 2, anaphase 30, anaphase 40, which anaphase? Okay, and that's the next thing that, that comes, I mean, that becomes important with mouses. You can't just write anaphase or prophase. Okay, you can. Prophase maybe, but you have to specify which phase because mouses happens in two phases, isn't it? Anaphase 1, anaphase 2. And I see that it say it happens during anaphase one. So we know that what happened here was non-disjunction, as I explained. Okay, and we know that occurs during anaphase one. So if you name what happened, you get a mark. Okay, and if you name the phase, you get a mark. Now remember, if you did not say anaphase one, and I know you guys are going to be in a hurry when you are answering your, your, your paper, but try and slow down. When you don't say under phase one, you lose the second mark. You're not going to get the second mark over there. So always try and remember to say under phase one. I see Robin will also said non disjunction takes place under phase one. Absolutely. Fantastic. OK, so that's the one way. That's the first two marks you, you need to mention there. And then obviously the last mark that you need to mention is um, the two chromosomes move to one pole or the two chromosomes um, only move to the other pole, meaning none of them move to the other pole and both move to the one pole. So anything along those lines, that would be correct. Okay, and now that makes a bit of sense for you guys there. Then 2.4.2 asked you if gamut A is involved in fertilization, you must now describe how this may result in Down syndrome. So what's gonna happen here is that the gamut um, A has two chromosomes, we know that, or an extra chromosome, and when it fertilizes a normal ovum, and remember you're looking at a male, that's why we say ovum, and that's why the mark is on ovum, the zygote will have three chromosomes at position 21. And any three of this would give you your marks. Okay, I know you guys got that one right. And then uh, 2.4.3, uh, says due to the process of crossing over, the chromosomes in diagram A and B appear to be different from each other. And again, they're asking you at A, identify the phase of meiosis during which crossing over occurs. And remember now you have to state mouse, uh, the phase, meaning metaphase one, metaphase two. You have to say anaphase one, anaphase two. You can't just say anaphase. And then you have to describe the events leading or during crossing over. You're just saying there what's gonna happen. So let's look at that quickly. So here it was pro phase one and very, very important grade 12s. You have to state pro phase one. I cannot emphasize that enough. If you just said pro phase, incorrect. I'm sorry, the, the mark is not given. Maybe your teacher gave it to you because you or she is lenient, but it's not given end of the year. So please try and memorize the phases and always write pro phase one or pro phase two or whatever. Okay. 
And then finally, what happens during um, crossing over? Adjacent chromatids of homologous chromosomes cross. So you get a mark for that um, at the point called the chiasma. And I know you guys learned this already. And there is an exchange of DNA segments or they are exchanging DNA or genetic material. And that's your three marks there. Now, just a note of caution when answering B. When we deal with meiosis, okay, you need to memorize another term and that's called homologous chromosomes. Homologous chromosomes. Just throw it out there. Even if they're not asking about it, just write homologous chromosomes. Never, ever, ever write chromosomes because you don't know, for example, if they don't know your work very well, you might not know when it is homologous and when it's not. So you just throw in homologous anyway. Just write homologous chromosomes, homologous chromosomes. Doesn't matter what the question is, homologous chromosomes. Because if you just said chromosomes, and I'm just going to scratch out the homologous here. If you didn't write homologous and you just wrote chromosomes, guess what? You lose this mark. Okay, it's tough. I know it's tough, but um, that's how strict they mark end of the year. So please try and memorize homologous chromosomes when it comes to mouses. Regardless of what it are, they just say homologous chromosomes. You you'll be sure to get the mark. Okay, and that was meiosis. Uh, any questions on meiosis? Remember, meiosis is only in paper two, so you don't study meiosis for paper one. Please don't study meiosis for paper one. Meiosis will only be for paper two. I'm gonna pause 14 seconds just to see if there's any questions, and then I'll continue. Any questions from anyone? I don't see any questions so far. So I assume I have your permission to move on. Um, I know you guys were through this already. I did ask you to do it for homework. Okay, that wraps up my houses. Um, just a few takeaways once again, always study the phase and 102, always study the, the, um, the disorders and remember to always write homologous chromosomes regardless of what they ask because if it's only chromosomes or you say chromatid, incorrect sister chromatids, incorrect. What we use is homologous chromosomes. That is always correct. Moving on to question three, and we're closing in towards the end of paper two um, under question three. So let's just look at question three quickly. Okay. The first one has to do with hemophilia, and it says hemophilia is a sex linked to genetic disorder that can cause excessive bleeding in people who are affected. The X chromosome carries either the recessive allele, and you'll see here they give you the recessive allele as lower letter H. I just want to highlight it quickly. There it is, the allele is H as recessive, and the dominant allele, and the dominant allele is the capital letter Y. So try and highlight that for yourself. Um, that's going to be important. Okay. So I we have a comment. Uh, is it possible for you to enlarge your screen? Um, not on the PowerPoint. Uh, if the learners don't have this in front of them, I am going to have to. I'm going to try and zoom in a little bit. Uh, yeah, that's what I can do. I don't know if that's a bit better. Yes, that's much better. We can okay. see that now, sir. Okay. Okay, so I, I am going to try and enlarge it on my side as well. Um, and if you guys still can't see how this is okay, I'm just going to have to scroll down. Okay, yeah. I'm going to enlarge it and then I'll just go out when I want to look at the questions again. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. So when it comes to this type of diagram and I want to ask this in the chat, what do we call this diagram? Quickest one in the chat. There's a name for it. You guys can let me know. The first thing you guys must do is you always fill in the genotypes. Okay. And I'm going to go through it now in a second. So it is the pedigree diagram, and that was in the in the question there. It was whatever Easter egg shows you the inheritance of hemophilia in a family. You must study it and answer the question. So let's look at this. Right. First things first. Even before you get to the questions, and I'm not going to embarrass myself. Okay, I am going to by writing on the screen. You fill in your genotypes. I'm just going to zoom out so I can write. So M, uh, not M. Sorry. The circle is obviously a female, and that's Mandy. And we know that females always have X and X. OK, your males, which will be Peter, that will be X and the Y. So you fill that in for yourself. OK, please do that. Please do that. You'll see now why it's important before you get to the questions. So you fill that in first things first. Then the next thing you fill in is who is affected and who is not affected. Now I'm going to zoom in again. 
Remember, it says that hemophilia is a recessive trait, and when the trait is recessive, you must have two small letter H's. You can't just have one. Okay, but we're going to see now why you can have one, actually. Um, and then the dominant trait is normal, and that would be a capital H. So when something is recessive, we know that you must have two. That's what we teach you in the beginning. But because we're dealing with a six-linked disorder, okay, in males, they will only have either the small letter H, which is recessive, and they have hemophilia, or they will have the dominant letter H, capital letter, which is normal. So you have to keep that in your mind for answering the question. So you always write in the um, genotypes here, and you kind of do the same here. So you go, okay, this is a female, this is a male. So you go X, Y, and then you do the rest for the others. I'm not going to do it. It's going to take me up until the end of the session to write with my mouse. So just fill that in for yourself, and then you fill in who's affected and who's not affected. Now, how do you figure that out? Start with the parents, the P1. Okay, so if we look at the P1, we can see um, in the P1, you have um, a female, and because it is um, not colored in, that means Mandy is normal, okay? So she is not affected. But then you see Peter here. Peter is affected. So Peter must have on his X chromosome, he must have an H. So you put in an HD. He must have one HD. Now, what does Ma Mandy have? Mandy has two possibilities, and I'm just gonna write it here on the side. Mandy, remember, has now XX. Uh, the one possibility is she has a capital letter H, which is normal, and she has another capital letter H, which is normal. That's the one possibility. The second possibility is that she has an X, one capital letter H, meaning the one, um, this chromosome is normal, and then she can have a X and then a small capital letter H, and this means she's a carrier. And our carry means that she has the hemo hemophilic um, gene, but the normal gene is kind of masking or blocking it. So she's a carrier. You don't know which one is which yet. Okay. And you will you will figure out as you go along. So it can be either this one or it can be this one. Rather write in both for yourself. If you don't know, then you know you are working with two possibilities. If you want a shortcut or a little tip on how you do know which one it is, when you look at her offspring, she has one, two, three, four, five, six. They have six kids. Let me just put my laser pointer. Um, over here at the bottom, they have six kids here, okay? And you can see one, two, three, four out of the six kids are affected. And to get that high rate of infection, that means Mandy must have been a carrier. So it's probably most likely this one over here. Okay, hope I'm, I'm still um, keeping you guys' attention and still following me here. So now you fold in, obviously, the genotypes for the parents. You have filled in the genotypes here, and we know if it is a female, sorry, if it's a male, then it must have a small capital letter H. So watch me just put that in over there, uh, meaning all these males, this one over here, okay, will have the same genotype as Peter. This one over here will have the same genotype as Peter, and they will have the same gen genotype as this one here, whether that is Susan or Jenna or whoever, they will all have the same genotype. For um, Reina, okay, Reina is a female and she's affected. So to be a female and to be affected, um, you have to write this in for yourself. And if you don't write in other stuff, maybe you're too lazy or you're too much in a, in a hurry, write in this one for an affected female. Because she's a female and she's affected, we know it'll have an X and an X, right? And because she's affected, both Xs must have a small letter H. So the genotype of Reina will be X small letter H, X small letter H. And I hope that makes a bit of sense to you guys. Okay, so keeping all of that in mind, I'm going to take it away. Um, if you guys wrote it down, I'm, okay, I'll keep it up for another uh, five seconds because I'm going to erase it now. With all of that in mind, the questions will be super easy for you. And you're going to see now when we get to the questions, it's going to make a lot of sense. So now it says 3.1.1. You have to write down the genotype of Mandy. And I'm just going to focus in again on this one. So now when we see the word genotype, I explained to you, always think about the letters, you don't want to speak about hemophilia for genotype. Genotype means what is the letters, okay? What is the genes? So you want the genes of Mandy. And remember now, Mandy was a female that um, had a um, either this option over here, 
which was homozygous normal, or she was a carrier. But remember I told you because so many kids are affected, the genotype for Mandy must be the second one because there are so many kids that are affected. So when you write down the genotype for any sex link disorder or any pedigree diagram, and I know my kids make this mistake as well, you always write down X capital letter H and X capital um, small letter H. Do not write H and H only. Okay, so please don't do this. It's not technically incorrect. You are correct. But why won't we give the mark end of the year? Because you are dealing with a six link disorder. Okay, so six link disorders means you have to write the X or the Y. So please remember that for end of the year. Okay, genotypes, you write the letter and you always write the X and the XY with it. Secondly, uh, question B, you have to give the phenotype of Reina. Now, the phenotype means you have to tell me if she has hemophilia or if she's normal. Simple as that. Okay. And remember, I ask you to write down Reina's genotype. So to get to the phenotype, you can either just say, okay, here at the bottom in the key, it mm. says hemophilic female um, for a dark circle, normal female for white circle, and normal male for a light square and a affected male for dark square. So you can get that straight from the ski. So Raina is obviously a, a dark circle and that would be a hemophilic female and that would be your phenotype. And you can see it by B, hemophilic female, simple as that, that is your phenotype. Okay, you don't have to write about the, the, the genes and the X and the Y, you just have to write it's a hemophilic phenotype. All right. Please let me know if there's any questions. Are we happy to slow down or to just um, answer questions? I'm gonna erase this because I need space for the next couple of questions. Now we at 3.1.2. I'll zoom in again for um, just those who can't see. So 3.1.2 says explain why Tumi is unaffected. Okay, now you have to find Tumi first of all. Where is Tumi? I'm gonna just zoom in again. Tumi is over here, the last um, person, and we know Tumi is a male. Okay, how do you know it's a male? The key tells you it's a normal male. And here comes the important part. Because Tumi is a normal male, the first thing you must understand is that if the male is normal, it inherited an X and a Y because it's a male. Okay, now the question is, which X did um, Tumi inherit? And there were two. There, were, there was one that it was the normal, which was the capital letter H, or the affected, which was the small letter H. If Tumi inherited the small letter H, okay, then we would remember Pete, that was Peter's um, genotype, then Tumi would have been affected because it inherited or he inherited the small letter H. But because Tumi is normal, that means Tumi must have inherited the normal H from Mandy. So the genotype of Tumi would be X capital letter H, meaning it got the normal phenotype genotype from Mandy. Remember Mandy's um, genotype was X capital H and X small letter H. So it got one of the X's and Tumi was lucky to get the capital letter H, which is the normal one. So that um, chromosome there was given to Tumi and it got obviously a Y chromosome from Peter, which was normal. And that's why Tumi was unaffected. And that's what it says here. Tumi inherited the normal um, allele XH from Mandy, which is his mother, and he also inherited the Y chromosome from Peter, which is his father, and that does not carry the allele for hemophilia. Okay, three easy marks over there. Okay, just meaning that Tumi doesn't have an, as the normal um, blood clotting factor. Any of those three was correct. And then lastly, um, let me just zoom in again, because I know people are going to say, there we go, it says, Mention, um, sorry, explain, I'm a bit too far here. There we go, 3.3. Reina inherited a condition from Peter. Is the statement above correct? Now we have to go to Peter again. Okay, so Reina obviously was affected. Now you have to remember what Reina's um, chromosomes were, or genotype, it was X, small letter H, X, small letter H. Okay, now Reina is affected because obviously it, it got the one small letter H from Mandy, and that small letter H, because it's now a female, it got the small letter H from Peter as well. So Mandy got both from XH from, from the mother. Sorry, Raina got both from um, an X small letter H from the mother 
and from Peter, but the hemophilic gene is always on the X chromosome, and we know the X chromosome comes from the female. So if they ask you, is the above statement true that it got it from Peter only? Now, let me just highlight that. Sorry, guys. And the key word here is Peter only. That cannot be true, okay, because Peter only has one X. Raina must have gotten the other X from, it, from her mother. So the answer is no, okay? And I just explained that for you guys. So, sorry, there's the answer, no. And I just explained that in all of the words I used. Raina inherited one recessive allele XH from Peter. And we know that is true because Peter was affected. Let me just go back. There we go. There Peter is affected. And now you guys see why it's important to fill in all these genotypes before you answer the questions. Because once you fill it in, you can answer the questions easily. If you didn't fill it in, you would have been now probably very, very lost or very, very confused. So always fill in all these genotypes beforehand and the questions will be easy. So Raina gets um, one recessive allele from XH from Peter, who is a hemophilic male because he's affected. She also inherits um, another recessive allele XH from Mandy, who is normal, but heterozygous or a carrier XH from his mother, from um, her mother. And since Raina is a female, she had to have XX and she must have had both small letter H's, which is the hemophilic allele. And that's a compulsory mark, meaning you must mention X small H, X small H, and that caused it to be hemophilic. Okay, and therefore Raina inherited the condition from Peter and Mandy. And that was the last mark over there. So we get four marks over here, and I hope that makes sense how you get to those four marks. Okay, we are at the last question, 3.1.4. Let me just zoom in over here. This says, mention three factors which could have brought about variation that are evident um, in the phenotypes of the siblings. Very easy, you just have to know your sources of variation here. We've done this now since paper one. And your source of variation is crossing over during end of pro phase one. So you mentioned that random arrangement of chromosomes, mutations, random fertilization, not random mating. Very important. Not random mating. I see my learners do it as well. Not random mating. Okay, it's only random fertilization or random arrangement of chromosomes, not random assortment, and crossing over during pro phase one. And that is your sources of variation. Okay, that's it for the pedigree diagram. Any questions from anyone? I'm going to pause for about uh, 8 to 10 seconds just to see if any questions come through. Right, I see no questions from anyone, so I'm going to continue um, to the last, second last question. Okay. So this one is a seven marks. This is quite easy. This is a hybrid cross. I am going to ask if there's anything specifically that learners struggle with here. Otherwise, I'm just going to go through the answers because for a hybrid cross, you never have to cross it. You just have to um, know how to read it. So you never, never have to do one. You will only be asked a mono hybrid. So if there's anything unclear um, here, I will gladly go through it. If not, I am going to um, just um, skip to the answers so that we can get through the next question as well. So anything unclear here for anyone? Just a few tips. You can just uh, let me know in the, in the, in the um, comments if there's a, a question there. Um, excuse me, sir, there's a comment. Can you go back to the memo of... 3.1.2, please, you are going too fast from Proteus. Okay, 3.1.2. And Robin Vale. Which was this one? Um, guys, 1.2. Yeah, so I have the one up. Okay, so I'm going to leave this up for a few seconds if they want to write it down. Um, we did say you'll get the memo. Um, yeah, we're going to be a bit pressed for time a bit later, but I'll leave it up if you guys need to write it down. But remember, the memo will be made available. That's why I'm not standing still by the memo, because you guys will have it. So I'll just leave it up for a few seconds. I'm going to have to move on, unfortunately, um, because, yeah, of time constraints. We only have 
under for just about over 40 minutes left and I still need to do the consolidation with you guys. Right, um, can I move on? Is I know that you guys can't write down the answers in the time I leave it up, but you will have the memo. Okay, I'm gonna repeat, you will have the memo. Okay, so I'm gonna go to 3.2, um, and I don't didn't see anything specifically that is a problem, so I'm just gonna go to the answers. So 3.2.1, you have to give the genotype of one, which was this over here. And 3. Point, uh, sorry, 3. one b you have to give the phenotype of 2, which was this over here. Now remember, genotype means the letters. So when I want the genotype, I want to know what the letters is. And because it's a dihybrid cross, you're always going to have four letters instead of two. Okay, so genotype at 1, how do you get that? Very, very simple. All you do is you're going to say um, the G here. I'm just going to do this with my highlighter. This G here will cross with that G there. So that's going to give you a capital letter G, small letter G. And this capital T here will cross with that small letter T there. And that's going to give you big letter T, small letter T for number one A. OK, the phenotype is what you physically see. Um, and the phenotype would be what I want to see or what, what you will see, not the letters. Meaning if it's going to be a um, a uh, green plant or a yellow plant or with thorns or no thorns. So let's just go to, um, I'll go to that now. And then number 3.2.2, you must list four genotypes of the offspring in the second generation. That would be phenotypically and genotypically different from the parents. Now I just want to stand still here for a second. When they want you to list genotypes, you're obviously going to now list the letters, meaning G, G, T, T or whatever. Um, but you can't just list any random letters. You have to list what was phenotypically different from the parents. Now, how do you know what the parents phenotype was? If you go to the top here, the second paragraph, I'm going to highlight it for you guys. Okay. The second paragraph says you had two plants that were crossed with genotypes, capital letter G, capital letter T, and small letter G, small letter um, T. Now, if you fill in the phenotypes of the first one, capital letter G, um, and capital letter T, you would see it would be a green plant. Okay, that's the first thing you understand. So that's a green plant and it would have um, thorns for a capital letter T. I hope you guys are following with that one. Okay, and then for the next parent, it would be small letter G. So that would be a yellow plant, which was that, that was crossed with no thorns. So that was the parent. So whatever, pheno, whatever genotypes you give in 3.2.2, it can't be the same as the first parent, meaning green with thorns. It also can't be the same as the second parent, yellow with no thorns. So it can be green with no, no thorns, or it can be yellow with thorns. That's just two of them that would be different. Okay, and then you just look for it in the table. So where do you find it? So now I look for um, green, meaning GG with no thorns, and you can see this one over there already. Just highlight that one. That's green. Sorry, I'm lying. That's green with thorns. That's a mistake over there. So you're looking for green with um, no thorns. So it would be this one here. OK, that's green, no thorns and yellow with thorns. And that would be this one over here. OK, and if I just show you the answers for that, it would be there. OK, so there's 3.2.1 A, B and there's 3.2.2, all the possible options. Any questions for this one? Remember, guys, the memo will be made available. So please don't try to write down everything. Just check your answers, but don't try to copy the memo. Otherwise, you're not going to. I don't have enough time for that. So just check that your answers are correct. If you did not get to this question, that's OK. Do it on your own. Go through the memo or come back to the recording. OK, I'm going to move on to 3.3. And 3.3 has to do with blood groups. OK, now again, um, is there anything from those who work through this, anything that was unclear for blood groups? Otherwise, I'm just going to go to the answers as well. And as I see, you guys can always come back 
um, over this. If there is a question, otherwise I'm just going to go to the um, answers. If there's um, any issues, you guys can just work through this again. Okay, so it says human blood groups are controlled by multiple alleles. What you do in the exam, you write down the alleles, okay, for the multiple blood groups. We know there is A, A, B, and O. It says name all the alleles that can control the human blood group. And when you ask for the alleles, please don't write blood group O, blood group A, blood group B, blood group whatever. That's not alleles, okay. The alleles, as I will show you now, has to do with the genotypes, always. Then it says how many alleles um, in question 3.3.1. Um, can an individual hit it? Now, you would know that the blood groups has three alleles, okay? And that, that is correct, meaning it has blood group A, blood group B, and blood group O. It has three alleles. But if they ask you how many can an individual hit it, an, indivi an individual cannot be A, B, and O, is it? It can either be A, B, or O. So the maximum it can hit it because it can only um, be A, B, either A, or it can be O or B, is two alleles. Two alleles, not three alleles. They're kind of trying to catch you out here. Okay. And then we're going to look at the, the reason for that in a second. But it's because, as I said, you can only inherit one from your mother and one from your father. Okay. I'll show the answers now. I'm just going through the questions to show you guys how to go through it. And then it says a man has blood group A and his wife has blood group B. We know that's dominant. And we know the first child has blood group AB, that makes sense. And the second child has blood group O. Now I need to say, okay, how do you get blood group O? What can we conclude about the blood groups of the future children? I'm just going to go to the answers for this one. So we know the alleles, as I said, was, uh, was A, B, and O. And that's how you write your alleles for 3.2.1. Please just check that, guys. The alleles a person can inherit is two, not three. Okay. And the reason, as I said, any individual um, can only inherit one allele from each parent or one from the father and one from the mother. And then finally, each child has an equal, for 3.2.3.4, each child has an equal chance or 25% chance of having any blood group. Okay, this, this is about nine marks in the um, end of your paper. And you just have to understand that there are three alleles. You can only inherit two. And um, that when all three are present, each child has a 25% chance. Okay, the memo will be given to you guys. You don't have to worry about it, but I'm going to move on from this one. Okay, but you will have the memo. Um, the resources will be sent. 3.4. Okay, uh, this had to do with a particular species of snail that is active at night and occurs in two varieties. The one is um, in white color. The other is in dark or dark brown. And a student introduced equal numbers of each of the varieties into a small garden. A year later, she counted the number of each one. And this is what she got. She got 20 for the white snails and 136 for the brown snails. Now, the question says explain the above in terms of natural selection. Now, you will remember when we did paper one, I explained to you that if you go to your exam guideline on page, I think it is 16 which is over here, okay? Page 16 tells you um, the variation or natural selection due to, ver due to um, variation, Darwin's theory. And you can study this exactly as it is there, okay? But there's a little trick here, okay? And the trick is when you are asked a question and they give you white color, brown color or white color and blue color or whatever, then you are given the variation. So you can't just say favor, um, favorable trait and the one trait is not favorable, as it says here in the um, exam guideline. What you have to then do is you have to say there is a great deal of variation. We know that some have the favorable um, characteristic, some do not. But in the example that we're doing, what is the faith, um, favorable characteristic in this example? Is it the white snails or is it the brown snails? It's obviously the brown snails, okay, because they have 136. So because this one has the um, or has more than that one, the brown snails will be the favorable characteristic. That's what you identify first. So whenever you have a question on natural selection, 
please identify what the characteristic is that is favorable and what is not. Otherwise, you're not going to get the marks. So let's see how we answer this. There was a great deal of variation in the snail population. As I explained now, the dark snails were, or you had snails that were dark camouflaged or had a favorable characteristic. The white snails were not camouflaged or they did not have the favorable characteristic. Predators then eat the white snails, or you can say they die or they got killed. Okay. Therefore, the dark snails will survive, they will reproduce, um, and there will be a higher proportion of dark um, brown snails in the subsequent generations. Simple as that. Okay. It is listed in the exam guideline, as I explained, but that is just how you give it there. Okay. Any questions for this one? We did this in paper one. So it should be straightforward, quite simple. Okay. You will have the, the, the memo, so don't stress about it. I'm going to move on to the last question, and then we're going to do our consolidation in the last 20 minutes or so. Okay, it's not tutoring. It's just giving you a couple of questions to answer and to see what, you, what you've learned. Um, but I'm going to finish off this with this last question, and then we will do the consolidation. Okay. So here you are dealing with um, a question on ev evolution. It says research is conducted an investigation where the brain volumes of various hominin fossils were measured and the results are shown in the table below. The brain volume measured in cubic centimeters of various hominins in the ev evolutionary sequence of existence is given to you. And that's the table I'm looking at. I'm going to zoom in just in case you guys can't see. Here we go. So here's the table. It shows you all the hominin species from um, different fossils, and it shows you the brain volume. Now, what did you learn? What is the relationship between the brain volume and a species? Okay, always write this down for yourself. The brain volume, or rather the higher or the bigger the brain volume, or the bigger the cranium, the most recent or the most advanced the species is. Okay, that's generally the, the rule of thumb for evolution. The bigger the, the brain volume, the more evolved or the more recent or the more advanced the species is. Okay, that's just a rule of thumb that you must write down for yourself. And then you have your different species here, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, etc. Okay, and if I ask you just as a general question, just based on the brain volume, which of them would be the oldest without having you studied maybe the work, and which would be the youngest or the most recent if you didn't study evolution, then you can tell yourself, right, the smaller the brain volume, the older the species is. That means a afarensis would be 445 cubic centimeters, the top one, that's the smallest brain volume, so that's the oldest. The biggest brain volume is Homo sapiens, that's 1,800, and that would be the most advanced or the youngest. So that's our sort of a rule of thumb. Yep. Can you please use your laser pointer? Of course I can. Okay, it's going to go small again. I can't for some reason use the laser pointer and zoom in. So I'm hoping you guys have zoomed in already. So as I said, the first one, A. afarensis, has a brain volume of 445 cubic centimeters. So the top one is the youngest. How do I know? Even if I don't study the work, the brain volume, small brain volume, oldest. The youngest or the most advanced would be Homo sapiens, the last one. How do I know? Because it has the greater or the bigger brain volume. Okay, and that's just something that you can guys can write down, that you can study. That will always be the, the, the rule of thumb when it comes to brain volume. Obviously, we know we don't only look at brain volume, but in this example, we do. 3.5.1, plot the bar graph. Okay, again, I went through graphs already in um, paper one, but I'll just remind you guys, when you plot the graph, you should have this. The memo will be available. I just want to show you where your marks will be. So remember, when you plot the graph, you get a mark for the correct type. Type of graph means that you've drawn a bar graph. Now again, my students do this. A bar graph means there has to be space between the bars, meaning this, there has to be about a space. If your bars are connected, that's not a bar graph. That's a histogram, number one. Okay. So if you draw a histogram, goodbye to your type because you lose that mark. So you get a mark for that. Then you get a mark for your heading, so we can just make that C for caption, and your heading must have both the X axis, which is the hominin, and the Y axis, which is the brain volume. They must have both in there. There's brain volume, there's hominin. Then you get the mark for the 
C. Right, so you have two marks already just by drawing the correct graph and having the correct um, heading. Then your next mark comes in for your axis. Okay, on the X axis, we look at did you name hominins and did you list the hominins? And here you can see it's listed. Let me just do that. So you get a mark for naming it and for listing it. Okay, and then on the Y axis, you get a mark for naming brain volume and then the scale. So let me just talk about the scale of the Y axis first. Your Y axis scale, and I explained this in paper one, okay? When you start with a number, here they start with 200, you continue with that same number, meaning you continue with 200. So you always start at zero, and then you decide, okay, if you go zero to 50, you can't go 50, 200, etc. That's incorrect. If you start with 200, you maintain 200 throughout. So it's two, four, six, eight, 1,000 because they're maintaining it. If you go grade 12 and you put in these numbers, okay, those numbers that you see there, and you put them exactly like that over here, you can say goodbye to the mark for the y-axis. We don't give the mark. And your graph won't be accurate even. Okay, so please always get a scale. How do I get a scale, sir? Well, you look at how, what, what your numbers are you working with. So you start with 445. If you wanted to start with 400 here at the bottom where the 200 is, let me just use my laser pointer. If you wanted to start with 400 here, you have to continue with 400. Okay, but because you're starting with 200, you continue with the 200. And then lastly, um, that's the scale for the Y axis. Okay, so please remember that. Remember that always. Lastly, the skill for the X axis, believe it or not, grade 12s, the length of your bars has to be the same. It has to be the same. So if this bar is this length, right? And I'm just going to make a, a, a kind of a silly drawing. And the next bar, which was this 110, let's say that bar looked like this. Let's just throw it in. Now it's bigger than the rest of the bars. And then your next bar looks something like this, smaller. And then the next bar is wide. Then you lose the mark on the X axis because your bars are not the same. Please ensure for a bar graph, please ensure that the bars are the same. How do you make it the same? Well, you can either say each bar is one centimeter in length or 0 0.5 centimeter in length, but you maintain that one centimeter for the bars. And we actually measure this at the end of the year. We sit with the ruler and we go, but you can actually pick it up with your eye. You can see, okay, if the bars are not the same, you're not gonna get the mark on the X axis. Okay, so we now gave you a mark on the Y axis, we gave a mark on the X axis, and then the last two marks is for plotting, meaning you've plotted your bar accurately. And that's how you will get your marks for 3.5.1, where you had to draw the bar graph. Any questions there for the bar graph? I'll be happy to ask, but I'm gonna move on to 3.5.2. You have to calculate the percentage increase. Now, I asked this to my learners as well. I think only about seven, not more than 10 got it correct. And I'm going to just stand still here with the percentage increase. When you are asked for the percentage increase in the brain volume of Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. So let's find Homo erectus and Homo sapiens on the um, little, little um, table over here. There we go. Homo sapiens would be at the bottom, number seven. That's 1,800. Homo erectus is number four. There you guys see it. That is 1,100. Now, if you thought you were smart and you said, okay, 1,800 minus 1,100, there's my percentage increase. That is not correct. Okay. The math lit kiddies, they would know how to calculate percentage increase, and it's exactly the same for life sciences. Okay. Your percentage increase will always start like this. You're going to have your larger volume, which was 1,800. Remember, that was the Homo sapiens. You're going to subtract it from the smaller volume. That was 1,100. That was Homo erectus. And you're going to divide it by 1,100, the smallest brain volume. That's what you also learn in math lit. Um, recent minus previous divided by previous. And you always divide it of times by 100. And your percentage increase is 63.6. Okay, grade 12, this formula will always remain the same, whether you're doing life sciences or math lit or whatever, this formula remains the same, okay, for the percentage increase. Right, um, the rest was quite straightforward. Identify the type of variation demonstrated by the data in the table. 
uh, sorry, 3.5.3 formulate a conclusion based on the data represented in your graph. Yeah, you just had to say what's happening in the graph. So you can see the brain volume is increasing and the species is becoming more recent. So there you just had to say the brain volume development increases as new homo species are formed. Simple as that. OK, you guys will get the memo. Don't worry. And then finally, um, identify the type of variation and explain your answer based in this diagram. Now, we did two variations in life sciences. The one was continuous and the one was discontinuous. We did this in evolution. OK, and the example here was continuous variation. And that's because the brain volume increases from the lowest capacity up until the maximum capacity. OK. Obviously, as you go from um, Homo sapiens species, the most um, oldest to the most recent. OK, so study those variations, grade 12. You will see them. You absolutely will see them. OK, and then 3.5.5 and 3.5.6, you just have to state two characteristics of African apes and hominins that are shared and um, which species in um, the table exist most recently for 3.5.6. And remember, I told you the one with the biggest brain volume is the most recent. So that would be that one. And number B you said, give one reason to support your answer. And we're going to look at that now. But 3.5.5, two characteristics we shared African apes. You would have learned this already. It is any of the following binocular vision, opposable thumbs, upright posture, long rotating limbs, the money sense of smell, etc., etc. OK, any of those would be correct. And then um, 3.5.6, the Homo sapiens is the most recent because they have the largest brain volume or the largest cranium volume, as you guys saw in the diagram. OK, so that was on evolution and it does count the most marks in your paper two, but I'm sure that you guys are going to get these marks. OK, uh, that's it for paper two. I'm going to go on to the consolidation. Is there any questions um, for the last question I did? Remember, the memo will, will be made available for you, so you don't have to um, write down the memo. Instead, I just want to kind of give you an idea of how to approach each question. Okay. So that was consolidation of paper two. OK, I'm going to go on to the last bit now in the we have about 20 minutes left. And in the last 20 minutes, I want to actually give over to the teachers and the learners in the classroom. I'm going to put up section A of paper one um, and section A of paper two and give you guys about five minutes for each multiple choice. I just want you to answer the multiple choice as we go along. We'll see how far we get. And um, then we look at the answer. So it's just to apply what you've learned from paper one. OK, so I'm not going to explain anything here. I'm just going to ask you to answer the questions for section A for paper one. We'll see if we can get to paper two and then show you the answer. So there will be no explaining unless you guys have a big problem or there's a problem with the with one of the answers. Instead, I want you to just sit back, um, apply what you've learned and just answer the question. So I'm going to start with section A for 1.1.1. I'm going to stand still for two minutes on each slide because it's about two questions per slide and then you guys can answer the questions. OK, so let's see how far we get and I don't want you guys to post the answers. You don't need to. You're just answering it for yourself and I'll show you the answers at the end of the session. OK, so starting with question 1.1 um, for the paper one, you can read it um, write down A, B or C or D for 1.1.1 and 1.1.2. And then I'm going to go on all the way to 1.1.10 and we look at the answers at the end. Your time starts now. I'm going to stand still here for a minute and then move on to the next slide. OK, you just choose A, B or C or D and then we're going to move on. Right, I'm going to move on to the next one. Uh, 
stand still here for about a minute and a half to two minutes. You just choose A, B, or C. You guys don't have to post the answers. You're just answering it for yourself. I'll show you the answers towards the end. You got about uh, 20 seconds on this one. While the learners are working work with the with answers, on. can the teachers please complete the attendance register? It is in the chat. Thank you so much. Right, and I'm going to move on. I'm sure you guys have the answers already. 1.1.5 coming up. Just a minute here because it's one question. And we're moving on to one point one point six. So about two minutes for this one. Um, sir, just to let you know, you have 15 minutes left of your session. Thank you so much. Got about 20 seconds on this one. And we're going to 1.1.8. One minute exactly for 1.1.8. Got about 10 seconds. And I'm moving on. In fact, I'm going to stop at 1.1.8. Okay, so I'm going to put up the answers quickly. Um, and then you guys can just tick and then we'll do the next part, which is a biological term. So answers for that mark from 1.1.1 up until 1.1.8 only. OK, you can ignore 1.1.9 and 1.1.10. You can ignore that. So please mark how many you got right. You don't have to post. Just mark your answers.
Right, and we are moving on to 1.2 correct biological terms. There is nine of them, but I'm going to give you five minutes. Okay, let's see. Please answer them. I'm going to stand still here for five minutes, then we're going to mark. Right, let's mark quickly 1.2. Um, you just give yourself a tick if you got it right. Um, and then we look at 1.3. Um, I'm just going to pause to see if anyone is still busy. Okay, I don't see anyone still busy, so let's go. 1.2.1 starting now. There we go. Give yourself a mark. See what you got right. Remember, just give yourself a tick. You guys will get the memo. Um, of this, but I'm going to leave it up for another 10 seconds, but you can just give us a tick or an incorrect, and then you will get the memo. Moving on to 1.3. Right, let's get the answers quickly. Here we go, A, none, A, give yourself a tick, give yourself two ticks in fact, if you got it right. Okay, um, so we have about just under five minutes. I'm gonna skip um, the multiple choice for paper two, and I'm gonna go straight to the 1.2 for this one, and then you guys can just mark this at the end, and that's all we're gonna have time for. Okay, so for 1.2, so, so paper two, just see what you guys can answer here. I'm going to give you about three and a half minutes. I know you won't finish it. And then we'll, we'll just mark what we've done. And then I'm going to wrap up. Right, so let's see 1.2. Um, and I'm going to wrap up after this. So just give yourself a tick um, if you got it right. And uh, we will send the resources through to you guys to do it in a more relaxed time. But just see how many you got right. Okay, I'm sure you guys are done marking. Um, that's about all we have time for grade 12. So I want to thank you for your attention and for the last few sessions you guys joined in. Uh, wishing you the best of luck with your exams. I know it was a bit rushed at times, but it's uh, it's not easy doing all year's work in half an hour. Um, but thank you for your attention. If um, I hope you guys learn, learn something. And if you have any feedback, please mention in the feedback form. Okay, all the best for your exams, grade 12s. I trust you will do well. And um, good luck and thank you to all the teachers as well. And yeah, wishing you all the best. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your week.